My first experience writing code was kind of weird because I didn't even know that I was writing code at the time. And actually, in hindsight, I kind of wasn't. Um, it was using this... Um, well, let me just take a step back here. I remember my dad gave me a magazine which was called PC User because we were really into computers. We just thought they were really cool. We didn't do any coding, but I remember playing the Lemmings when I was younger um, on a floppy disk and just thought that was just so cool. Um, and kept trying to like relive that experience and trying to um, play that again and again throughout my life. But then I ended up losing the game and then I came back like 10 years later and was able to find it again. <laughs> anyway, um, dad kind of noticed that I had this, um, this desire to learn more about computers. And so he started buying this magazine for himself, but for me as well, called PC User. And I'd read about graphics card and have no idea what I was reading about and like, RAM and processors, and I still have no idea about this stuff, to be really honest. It's actually kind of embarrassing that I'm a coder, and like, I know, I kind of know what these things do, but just, I have, I'm not up to date with the latest in processors, and, you know, I don't know what Intel's doing, or, um, or what AMD's doing, or if they're even still around. See, it's embarrassing. I know that, um, apparently Mac has this, okay, anyway, <laughs> let's get back on track here. And then, so they used to have these demo games on there and these this demo software. And I'd always install the games and the software and play around with it. I just thought it was just so insanely cool that I could play a game for free. And even though it was just a demo, and I don't think we ever ended up buying any of the games, um, it, I just I just had a blast like trying out these different games and these this different software. And one day I came one day I came along this um, piece of software called the Games Factory Two. And I, rem I remember reading about it. There was a tutorial in the PC user magazine that showed you how to do something really basic with the Games Factory. And it was on the CD. I could go ahead and install it on my computer and give it a try. Um, and this was basically a... It's like a click editor for creating your own games. And it was way ahead of its time. The Games Factory was like insanely cool. And I was actually able to create my own games using things like sprites. I remember I'd go online and find these sprites of like Sonic and um, Mario, like these Mario Kart sprites. And I would make my own Mario Kart games and my own Sonic games. And then one of my friends, um, my, well, I got a friend called Ross and he got involved as well. Um, and he started making this Sonic game and we even made our own movies with it. We set it up so that we could do like like these cool animations. And I I remember making this game called um, Stick Matrix where you'd hold the down key and he'd do like the matrix like from the matrix movie and you could fire bullets at each other and do the matrix to dodge the bullets it was so cool and i set it up so that you could go up to a wall and you'd run up the wall and do a backflip <laughs> like it was really dodgily made uh, but it was just like so much fun like i had a blast as a kid making games on the computer all the other kids were probably outside having a good time um, I used to do, I used to climb trees. That's probably all the outdoor activities I did. Hated sports. I just stayed at home and made games using the games factory and just, just having a blast, you know? And it had this um, thing where you didn't even have to write code because what you could do is you could press like a play button and whenever an event happens, so if you ran into an edge, if something hit you, if you pressed a button on the keyboard, then something would pop up on the screen saying, um, you, an event just happened what action would you like to happen in the game? So this was really cool because you literally didn't have to write any code. You would just like, you would just press that button, hit the ground, a pop-up would come up and then you would say, when I hit the ground, I want my player to stop. So you kind of are writing code, but it's like such a great introduction to programming. Actually, I can't believe this doesn't happen anymore. Like it, people should learn to program with the Games Factory too. I don't even know if it still exists or if you can get it. Um, and they had this other thing called Multimedia Fusion, but that's like another story. It's kind of like a more advanced version of the Games Factory. Um, yeah, and so... But the point I want to make in this story is that as I started building more and more things with this, I started to run into this problem where I had I ended up with spaghetti code. And I mean wild spaghetti code. So eventually I started using like this sort of graphical editor that they had where you could have... It showed like a grid, so you could say... Um, you know, when this action happens, do this. And it was all like this big grid system. So it's kind of hard to explain, but you would click on these little squares in the grid and say the actions that would occur. Um, and it was really cool. But my code ended up just being a whole bunch of icons and dots on a screen. 
And this was my first experience realizing that I needed to refactor things. And I didn't even know what refactoring meant at the time. I didn't even know I was coding at the time. And so, um, and, and so I remember finding out that you could then put these things into folders. So you could create folders that would kind of organize your code. And so I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. I can use these, this folder mechanism. And then I found out later on that there's this um, concept of functions, right? Where you can actually have logic that is called from other parts of your code. I was like, wow, that's like amazing. And then I can like add in these these expressions or parameters to these functions. And so I started doing that as well. And and it was like, it was amazing because I ended up learning how to, all of these coding concepts by accident. And I actually remember at school, I wanted to learn how to program. This was in like year 11 or 12. And I was doing lots of music subjects. So I was doing like... Um, music with music to music to extension um so basically like three or four music subjects at school and i was doing dancing and i was doing um drama so all this artsy stuff and i remember saying to one of the teachers because i just changed dumb um, schools to another school and i said um, i really want to learn to code i want to learn how to program and um and i remember the guy saying to me like well you can't just learn how to program. Like you need to have experience. You need to have started it in year nine or 10. It's actually a really difficult subject and I don't think you'll be able to do it. And so I was like, all right, then I'll do information technology instead. And at school at the time, that was like a really, um, that was basically, you know, networking and, you know, you'd set up a database with Microsoft database key or whatever it's called. I can't remember what it's called. And it was just like really boring to be honest. But um, I really wanted to program and I was kind of, I'm really bummed out because looking back now, um, in, in I remember in late year 12, finding out, I think it was like through a friend, I saw one of the assignments that he was doing, or I read like part of the textbook as well, finding out that I already knew half of these concepts. And this guy, this teacher at school told me that I didn't know how to code and I wouldn't be able to learn this subject because I wouldn't know, because I wasn't a coder. And God, actually, I'm actually getting kind of emotional thinking about it. Like, I wanted to code. I, w I loved it. This was like my passion. I didn't even know I knew how to do it. And without even testing me, without even trying to figure out what knowledge I had, he probably saw that I was, uh, like, if we're really honest, he probably saw I was like the musical theater kid um, and I was the creative kid. And I, and I probably wouldn't be able to code. I didn't have the chops for it. Um, but in hindsight, I remember looking at the books and seeing these questions and they're talking about if statements and while statements and like functions. And I'm like, this is so easy. I've been doing this stuff for years. Like I figured this stuff out on my own. And they're talking about like, ref like different ways of refactoring your code. And um, I remember one thing I didn't know about though was classes. Um, and when I found out about them later on, I was like, holy crap, this is amazing. Um, but anyway, the point of this podcast was actually going to be about spaghetti code. And I ended up telling a bunch of my story, but I don't know. Hopefully you guys found that interesting. Um, and I actually ended up not getting a, not getting into code and going off and doing piano and musical theater for the next four or five years of my life and getting into code later on. You know, I didn't, I didn't code then for another six or seven years of my life, um, you know, which is, I don't know if it's sad because I really enjoyed music, but anywho, so... I ended up with like crazy spaghetti code using this program. And one thing that I learned, and I learned this the hard way after years of writing crappy code, is that it's really, really important to organize your code from the beginning, to try and think about the structure of your code from the beginning. This doesn't mean you can't hack away at things, but whilst you're hacking away at things, I think it's important, or at least I found it's important, that the architecture, the future API and the future architecture is sitting at the back of my mind. So I might do like a really quick proof of concept, but while I'm doing that, I'm thinking, okay, this is bad about the architecture. This is bad. Um, this would look better in a class. And I'm building up this image in my head whilst I'm writing the code to think about what it should look like um, what the API should look like and what the structure should look like in the future. This is why um, if you've ever watched any episodes of the Quasar show, you'll see that I love talking about architecture. I'm super passionate about it now because um, there's nothing better than being able to write lots and lots and lots of code without feeling like it's spaghetti code, without feeling like you've coded yourself into a corner. And that is a worthwhile thing investing into. And it's, you know what? It is actually so much fun. When you could delete code 
um, when you can start keeping your code more and more dry, and then you can code things faster in the future because you've set up a really good system, that is the, oh my God, that is the most exhilarating feeling. When you spend, like, when you spend sometimes like a month, I, I remember spending a month working on a whole total restructure of the code base at work where I started, I had this epiphany where I'm like, okay, I need to have models. I need to have my components sitting, um, you know, in separate files so that they can be used in all of my different Quasar applications. And I need to just pull everything apart and have them in like these separate locations. Um, and like, and I just kind of, after having all that experience of working for that company for about two and a half years, um, I just kind of took all of that knowledge and created this architecture. It's, I think it happened like one night when I was lying in bed. Uh, this, this architecture just almost like revealed itself to me. And then over the next month, I built that architecture. And now, ever since then, building applications has just been bliss. And it is just the most exhilarating feeling. When, um, you know, the, the guy that I work with is like, this is what I want you to build. These are the models that I want. We'll sit down, we'll map out the UI on Miro, which is like a whiteboarding application that we use. And we'll like work on it together. And then I know that I can sit down at my computer and I can turn that into a reality. And it's not going to be spaghetti code. You know, it's going to feel good. It's going to be code that I know can scale moving forward. That is such a great feeling. And so I guess um, I ended up telling a lot of my story, but the, to the message I really want to tell you here is that if you're starting out, you can't th you can't do all of this at the beginning. It's just too much for your brain to handle, and that's totally fine. Don't try and have a perfect architecture from the beginning. That would be a huge mistake. You would never get anything done, and you wouldn't have a chance to make mistakes and learn. In fact, there's, there's a lot of stories about people that spend so much time. They go to university, and they spend so much time trying to get the perfect architecture that they get nothing done. What I recommend is writing crap code there's nothing wrong with writing crap code when you're a beginner. And then, but you need to be thinking at the same time, how can I architect this um, and go back and architect this? And then make sure you actually go back and refactor that code. And then later on down the line, as you get a really good feel for architecture, you'll be able to write quality code from the beginning. And you'll start to, you'll be able to start implementing things like TDD. So like, I actually, I don't think people should be doing TDD when they're first learning to code. I think that's absolutely nuts. Um, to expect someone to learn TDD from the beginning. It, it'd be totally boring and just crazy. But um, as you get a good feel for architecture, as you get a good feel for what you want your APIs and your code to look like, and you start learning like the solid design principles and where these principles apply and don't apply, and you start making up your own rules for coding, as all of that sort of clicks into place, then you can start having more refactored and clean code from the beginning. But I recommend making mistakes, but take the time to go back and refactor that code and make it clean to, and avoid spaghetti code moving forward because you're going to learn a lot of lessons along the way there. And you know, sometimes there'll be bits of code that you refactor five, six, seven or eight times. Um, and that's fine. Make sure you keep pushing forward. There needs to be a balance between pushing forward and going back and refactoring. Um, but, but you know, you want to lie in the right ends of that spectrum. If you lie too far on the end of the spaghetti code spectrum, like just get it done, make it happen, um, go, 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 go. Just do what you're, especially if you work for um, a company that, you know, wants you to build things fast. If you spend too much time in your life just building things fast, you're going to end up being a really sloppy developer. Sorry, I hate to say it, but it's the reality. You'll end up being a sloppy developer with code that you hate in a job that you hate because you hate looking at your code base. And then people are going to say, can you build this? You know, can you do this in our code base? And you'll, you know, scratch, you'll end up scratching your head and going, oh, I don't know if I can do that. I don't, you know, I don't think our code can allow that. You know, you hear that a lot from developers. Our system doesn't allow for that. But if you write good, clean code from the beginning and you do a good job refactoring it from the beginning, then you can always say, yeah, I can do that. I can make that happen. Um, or if you, and if you, if you can't make it happen immediately, you'll have the dis discipline to say, I can't make that happen now, but you know what? I'm willing to put in the effort to restructure our bits of our code base to make it a reality if it makes sense for the business. So um, anyway, that's something that I wanted to share with you. Got to get out a bit of my story. This has turned into a longer podcast than usual, but hey, uh, <laughs> I enjoyed it and I hope you enjoyed it too. So if you love my stuff, as per usual, check out quasarcast.com slash register. 
refactor your code, but don't refactor it so often that you never get anything done. Hope you enjoyed this one. I'll see you in the next episode.